tonight I want to jump right into, we're going to look at the text that we were in last week. And, um, and so Numbers chapter 13 and verse number 1, and, uh, and this is where we kind of left off last week. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, And send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, one, every one a ruler among them. So this is the story we kind of looked at last week. There, were, there, are, ten, there are 12 tribes of Israel, and uh, each one of the tribes, they took a leader out of that tribe. And, and uh, remember, the Israel has left Egypt. They've been marching uh, toward the promised land. They get to the edge of the promised land. Moses sends in 12 men, 12, the Bible calls them spies, and that's kind of what they were. He said, go in and check the land out and bring us back a report. And again, I know we talked a little bit about that. So they went in, and what did they find there? Well, they found out that it was a pretty amazing amazing land. The expression that the world uses, the world even knows today and doesn't know, probably doesn't know it came from the Bible, but it's a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Now, what does that mean? Well, it just means that it's everything you could imagine was there. Everything you could want was there. Plenty of food, plenty of, uh, uh, you know, plenty of, you know, anything that they could have needed. So that's, so they came back. And in fact, that when they went in, they, they, they went through, they went from city to city. They checked out things. They looked at everything. They were, they happened to be there at the time of the grape harvest. If you remember this from Sunday school, you probably covered a little picture of these, of a giant cluster of grapes. They, they brought back this cluster of grapes that was so large that it it took two men. They put it on a pole, and two men carried it back. So, so they came back with this amazing fruit. They came back with this, uh, this report that the land was incredible. But then things went south, didn't it? You, and most, uh, most everybody knows the story. So here we go, verse 27. And they told him, they said, we came unto the land which you sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. And by the way, that was true. What they said is true, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. Now, that's kind of what we focused on, that, that, uh, that name Anak. And we know uh, we, we read that last week. We know what that, what that meant. It's talking about giants. Let's continue on. Verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people. Now, there were two men. There were two men of the 12. There were 12 men. Ten of them brought back a very, uh, this report said, we're, you know, we're afraid. The two men who brought back a good report, the two men who said we can do it, Caleb is one. Does anybody remember who the other one is? Joshua. That's right. Caleb and Joshua. So Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. Now, isn't it interesting that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that, that Caleb, you know, Caleb went to the same place these other 10 did, but he says, no, we, let's just go right now. We are well able to overcome, overcome it. But then immediately notice verse 31, and we're going to get the full story here. But the men that went up with him said, we are not able to go up against these people for they are stronger than we. Again, that's very true. They are stronger than the Israelites were. They, they were much stronger. The Israelites were just coming out of captivity. Verse 32, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eats up the people, eats up the inhabitants thereof. And the people that we saw in it are men of, look at the next two words, great stature, and then they get very specific, and there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so were we in their sight. Now, what is he saying there? Well, that's kind of a, a, a way, the way that they were expressing, they simply said, look, they're just too big, they're just too strong, we cannot take them. We cannot take this land. So here, they've, they've marched all the way from Egypt, all the way through the wilderness. Now they are to the point of the promised land, and this is where they are. Now, did this, did this upset God? Yes, it did. Of course it upset God. This, this displeased God very, very much. God had brought them here. So God had, uh, the, the people listened to the 10 and they rebelled. They said, look, we're not going to do this. You know why you've come out, we've come out here. You brought us out here. Now we're just going to die. We can't take this land. So God had a choice. How's God going to deal with the people? Well, he could, <clears throat> in fact, his first inclination, and I've mentioned this before, his first inclination was he said to, he said to, to Moses, he said, look, Moses, you just need to step aside and I'm just going to, I will just wipe out these people and I will start all over with you. Take a look at, uh, uh, look at, look at verse, chapter 14. We move into chapter 14, notice verse number 11. I know we're going to get a lot of scripture in here early, but then we're going to see some pretty amazing things. The Lord said unto Moses, how long will this people provoke me and how long will it be ere they believe me? 
Now notice that's the important part right there. You notice what God said there. He said the problem with this people is they don't believe me. What does that mean? Believe me. They didn't believe that God could 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 help them. That's what we're gonna we're gonna, gonna get into tonight. They didn't believe that God was strong enough or powerful enough to help them overcome these giants. So he said, How long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have shown among them. And uh, and then he continues on, verse 12, I will smite them with a pestilence. And then here's the key word. Does everybody no- notice this next word? And will dis inherit them. Now, where did we hear that before? Where did we talk about this, co- this concept of God disinheriting somebody? If we go back the, at the Tower of Babel, right? All those nations, we go back to that story of the Tower of Babel hundreds of years prior when, when the people rebelled against God and said, we do not want God to be our God. And, uh, and so God disinherited all those other nations, all those nations at the Tower of Babel. When he spread them across the earth, they went this way, they went that way, and they... they, they and and, and when they did that, he also designated one of these sons of God as their, uh, as, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of be over them. And so, so the idea was he was going to then call Abraham and make a nation out of him that would be God's inheritance. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Israel. They became God's inheritance. God said, I will use Israel to show all those other nations that rejected me how powerful I am, and then they will all come back to me. So now we fast forward a couple hundred years, and here God is saying about this, He's saying, Moses, look, these people just aren't going to be, they're not going to be different. They're not going to be, they're not going to be, they don't believe me, so I can't, I can't help them. I can't do with them what I want to do. And, uh, and so God is, is saying that He's going he's to disinherit them. Now here's the amazing thing about Moses, and, and by the way, I can't really explain you know, people, I think we take a passage like this and somebody might say, well, does that mean God change? You can change God's mind. Does that mean you can, you can, uh, you know, something that God uh, wants to do and, and God says, this is what I'm going to do. And you can change his mind. Well, if you can't change God's mind, then why do we pray? Yes. Look, if you can't, if you can't go to God and talk, Moses was different. Now Moses spoke to God like, you know, and God even said, Moses is different. So Moses gets very, very bold here in his arguing. In fact, he argues with God. But I want you to notice what he does. He actually takes God's concept. He takes what God said he was going to do all those uh, centuries before, and he brings that back to God. He says, now, God, if you do what you're talking about doing, you're going to undo the whole plan of what you said hundreds of years ago. So watch as he makes this argument. Verse number 13. Here's Moses' argument. Moses said unto the Lord, he said, if you do this, the Egyptians will hear about it. For you brought this people up with might from among them. Remember when remember we talked about this? God brought them out of Egypt to show how powerful he was with all those plagues. Verse 14, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that you are the Lord, that, that you are, uh, that you, the Lord are, are, you're among these people, and that thou, Lord, art seen face to face in the, in the cloud by day, and the pillar uh, f- uh, cloud by day, and the pillar of fire by night. Uh, let's continue on. And uh, uh, verse number 15, he said, Now, if you kill these people, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Verse 16, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swore unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. Now let me explain. So here's what he said. He said, God, if you do this, if you, if you, if you just wipe them out and start over, all these nations that you showed yourself powerful to, they're all going to talk and they're not going to say that the people were too weak. They're going to say you're too weak. He said, God, you're going to undo what you did. You're going to undo this, this uh, image of you that you put out there when you brought Israel out of Egypt with such a mighty uh, hand. And so, and so, uh, so God listened to, a, to Moses. And so then he said, so here's what I'm going to do then. So the second option that he had was rather than destroying them and starting over with Moses, he's going to make them wander in the wilderness for how many years? 40 years. So let's look at what he said. Verse 21. Verse 21, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, all those that saw the plagues, they saw the the pillar of fire, they saw the pillar of cloud, they saw the Red Sea part and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these 10 times and have not hearkened unto my voice, continue on, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. So here's how this story ends. 
So this story ends with everybody over the age of 20, wandering, they're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and everybody over the age of 20 dies off during that period of time. Only those people that were 20 years old and down are going to live to go into the promised land. So for 40 years, they're going to wander in the wilderness and, uh, and it's, and, until, uh, until these new generations rise up. And of course, Joshua and Caleb were allowed, uh, they were the exception to that. Now, so they wandered 40 years and, uh, and, and now, we're, now they're back to the land of Canaan. All right, so that's the back story. Now, 40 years have passed. So we fast forward 40 years. Now Israel is back once again at the precipice of the promised land. And, uh, and now, why did they have to die? Why did those have to die? Uh, why did the, the adults have to die off? Wow. Wow. Who was that? I, I, thought it was, I thought it was Michael, the archangel, blowing the trumpet. I thought we were out of here. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's going to get on, on tape. Where was I before that? Before that happened? Oh, so why did they have to die off? You know, the, the question is, what was the real issue? Why did God say this generation? Yeah, exactly. It's unbelief. You see, they could not, and here's a really, really important point. This is what we got to launch off of tonight. They could not trust God to be powerful enough to overcome the, uh, and defeat the Anakims or these, these giants that we talk about the term, they came from the Nephilim, these giants from back in Genesis chapter number six. And this is the real issue of everything we've been talking about in this series. This is really the heart of the issue, is can, do, do God's people trust that God really is the Almighty? Is He different from those other, those sons of God we talked about, those other Elohim, and so on? So let me give you this statement. I think I put it in bold on your paper. So let me give you a statement here, because this is really the, 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 the main issue. The Israelites' problem at that time, they could not let their faith in an unseen God, override their fear of what they could see. The problem that they had, and, and the problem that these new generations are getting ready to face, we're going to find out if they have the same problem. But the problem that first generation had was that they could not let their faith in an unseen God override their fear of what they can see. Now, can I ask you a question? Is that really any different for us today? Do we not still have to put trust in a God that we cannot see? And, 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 you know, and, and that really is what faith is all about. It's believing the, in the God we cannot see that he is more powerful than what we do see. He's more powerful than what we see on the news. He's more powerful than what we see in, in the, the enemies. Uh, you know, in, he's more powerful than, than you know, the, the balance sheet that we have. You know, when, there's, you know, when you've still got, uh, you still got some bills left at the end of the month and, and you know, the money's all been... You know, this is the kind of thing that, that this is what we're talking about. But in their case, this was a big, big deal because what they were seeing, what they were looking at were giants. Real, literal physical giants. And so they were comparing themselves. Remember the, the expression they said? They said, when we looked at these giants, we felt like grasshoppers. You know, we felt like, you know, the, like an ant that somebody could just step on. And, and, and they saw the Israelites that way too. So, so, so let me ask you a question. If it was just purely a human battle, if it was just the Israelite people, humanity, going into the promised land to fight these enemies, who's going to win? Well, the giants are. Yeah, the giants are. They're, they're, they're going to win easily. So the issue then becomes, how much do they believe that God is over all of that? So, so the, the, uh, the two realms that we've been talking about, there's a, there's a visible realm and there's an invisible realm. There's a heavenly realm that we don't see. There's an earthly realm that we're always seeing all the way around us. <clears throat> and what's at stake now is that these, these, uh, the children of that first generation, that first generation that said, we cannot possibly take on these giants. The, their children now are coming up and they're going to face the exact same thing. Do you know those giants are still there? The Anakim are still there. The, the giants in that land are still there. The, the gods of those giants are still there, and they're still in the, in the current in, uh, over those uh, human inhabitants of that land. So what God is asking them to do is to believe in something that they cannot see. Believe in something they cannot see. Now, 
I want to show you a story which happened a few hundred years later, just as an illustration of this point, this fact that there's this unseen realm. There's a, there's a realm we see, there's a realm we don't see. If you, if you remember, as the nation of Israel would, uh, would be, as they, as they continue to progress through the, through the time of the judges, then into the time of the kings, there were some, there was a good king, David at, at first, you know, and, and by the way, we have David with us tonight, and uh, it's good to have David. I don't know if we were, I don't, is this the first time you've been here, David? Oh, I didn't think so. I thought, I didn't think so. So it's good to have you back. But uh, David was a, a great king. But after that, there were a lot of bad kings. And as time goes on, these, these prophets continue to come. And one of the most famous prophets in, the, uh, in Israel's history was a man named Elisha. And Elisha had a servant, had a helper, a protege, or a, you know, a, a, you know, a little apprentice, as it were. And, uh, and, and there was a time when, the, when there was a, a, an enemy that was coming to attack them and had surrounded them. They were all by themselves out in the, you know, they were out and they were in a tent. And, uh, and the servant, we're going to pick up the reading. I'm going I'm to I'm show this uh, passage to you. 2 Kings chapter number 6. So the servant of the man of God, that's the servant of Elisha, was risen early. He got up early in the morning and gone forth. And behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? In other words, he was saying, what are we going to do? They were surround, completely surrounded by the enemy, by chariots and horses and soldiers. And here's Elisha's answer. He said, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now, just take a time out for a minute. The servant is looking around and he's saying, um, yeah, there's nobody with us. <laughs> it's just you and me. And Elisha said, no, 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 you don't understand. Those that are with us are more than those that are out there. And he said, well, Elisha, I hate to argue with you, <laughs> but I'm looking. <laughs> I can see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of them. I can, see the, I can see that they've surrounded us completely, and it's just you and me. And so then Elisha, in verse number 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Wait, that he may see what? That he may see the unseen realm. And he opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. You remember that movie? That's where the expression came from. <clears throat> chariots of fire round about Elisha. You see, Elisha knew that there was an unseen realm where God was working, even though they couldn't see it. And there were soldiers, there were God's army, the, the, the host of heaven was all around them. But this young man could not see it. Now that's the same situation then that Israel is in back in our story. So we go back to the promised land. We go back to the edge of the promised land. Here's Israel. This new generation has, has grown up and they never saw what happened in Egypt. They were, they were not even born, most of them then. For 40 years, uh, Israel's been wandering in the wilderness. Now these new generations are coming up. They're at the edge of the promised land and they're going to face the same, the same struggle. They're going to see everything that their parents saw. They're going to see the giants. They're going to see the land. They're going to see how, you know, everything that their parents saw. And we'll see how they respond and we'll see how God, God deals with them. So this is the backdrop for them entering into the, the promised land. You see, Israel's going to fight two enemies. They're going to fight two enemies. When they enter the promised land, they're going to fight two enemies. The first one are the people of those nations that had rebelled back at the, that had now inhabit that land. That's the humanity. That's the, the humans that, that live there. But the second one is going to be the descendants of the Nephilim, the giants. They have to fight both of them. Now, please don't miss this next statement that I make, because this is really, really important. And this sets the stage for answering some of the really tough questions about why God did some of the things He did as they moved through the Promised Land. Both of these enemies, the humans and the giants, have to be defeated. They both have to be defeated, but one will have to be annihilated completely. One will have to be completely wiped out. You see... The, they both have to be, they have to defeat the, the people. They have to defeat the people. They have to, but God doesn't really want to kill all those people. God doesn't want Israel killing all of, the, all of the, the people who live in these cities of the promised land. He just wants them driven out. And in fact, if you, if you look at the instructions God gives, and we're going to see them in here in a minute, He tells them to defeat them but drive them out of the land because that is the land promised to Abraham's descendants. But He also says, but you also then must kill 
many of them. You must wipe them out. In fact, we're going to see a very graphic example here toward the end of the, end of the, the discussion tonight. Now, why is this? So why do the giant, why does one have to be completely annihilated where one is just simply, God just wants to drive them? But remember, you remember, God didn't want them all to die because God wanted to win them back, right? That was the plan, yes? We go back a few months in, in these discussions, that was the plan. God wanted to win them back. He wanted to bring those, the people back. But he had to destroy the others because, <clears throat> and, and, and why is that? So why, why did one group have to be completely annihilated? The other group had to be just simply defeated? Because one of the groups could be redeemed. See, humanity could be redeemed, but the giants could not be redeemed. The giants were not 100% human. Remember, the giants were the result. These giants that we're reading about, these Nephilim, these were the result of what we read clear back in, you know, months ago, back in Genesis chapter 6, where the sons of God took wives of humans and produced this off, these offspring that were not, they were not human. They were, they were they called them men of renown and, and giants and all those kind of things. So, so they can't be redeemed. Now, let me just kind of give you a little aside. This is not, don't, don't, don't take this, don't, don't take this as, as absolute truth because I don't know it. But there's a lot of Hebrew scholars who believe that these giants, when they're eventually all killed, Killed, that they will ev- that they're, they're, when, when these giants are killed, that it is, it is they, it is kind of their souls that actually are what we know today as demons. That's what some Hebrew scholars say. Some Hebrew scholars believe that, that when these giants were killed, it was their souls, disembodied souls, that would become what we know as demons today. That's what many of them teach. And I don't know if that's, you know, we don't know that that's true. We'll have a discussion about demons later on. But, uh, but it's just kind of an interesting con- uh, concept that the Hebrew scholars, that's what they believe. So God, so God has given some instruction now. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. So here they are. They're ready to take the promised land. They face the same thing that the, their fathers faced. God is saying, I want you to go in. I want you to, dis- I want you to conquer the entire land. I want you to defeat all of the enemies. And then he's going to say some very unusual things depending on who the inhabitants of each of those cities are. So let's take a look at God's instructions uh, as they enter the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter number 2 and verse number 1. So here's, here's the accounting of what happened. And then we turned and we took our journey into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. As the Lord spake unto me, he encompassed Mount Seir many days. And the Lord spake unto me saying, you come to this mountain long enough, turn you northward. So now they're supposed to enter in the command and command the people saying, you are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau. Wait, time out. Who was Esau's brother? Jacob. If we go back many hundreds of years, we find that, that uh, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the chosen one. Jacob is the one who is going to become Israel. Esau, however, Esau was not necessarily a, 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 abandoned by God, but instead God gave him a land. And this is what we're about to read about. He said, you're to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau, their, your distant relatives, which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed unto yourselves, therefore, watch verse 5, meddle not with them, for I, I will not give you of their land. No, not so much as a foot breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. All right, so here we go. The very first place they come to, God says, this is not yours. This is Esau's. So just pass on through. And, and he says, you know, you, you, can, you can buy food from them, buy water from them, things like that, but, but, don't, but don't try to settle there. Don't attack them. You're not to, you're not to attack them. That I, have, I have promised that to Esau. Just continue to walk on through. He does a similar thing with, uh, with, the, uh, the children of, uh, uh, with the children of Ammon. Notice in verse number, num- number eight. So he says it again. He said, and when we pass by our brethren, the children of Esau, through the way of the plain of Elath and the Ezion Geber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. For I will not give you of their land of a possession, because I have given our unto the children of Lot. Time out. Who's Lot? Abraham's nephew. Again, a distant relative. See, these are, these are still kind of part of Israel's heritage. And God says, you're not to take this land either. We're going to see a contrast here. This is why we're looking at these. So God says, this first place, this is, East, this is the descendants of Esau. This second place, these are the descendants of Lot. He does the same thing. We're not going to read, the, the, <clears throat> we're not going to read all the scriptures, but 
He does the same thing with the children of Ammon. They're also descendants of Lot. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, now, this passage tells us there used to be giants in the land, but God had driven the giants out of these lands for Esau. He had driven them out for Lot. So where did those giants go? Well, they ended up in the place where Israel's going. That's where they settled. So then we come to, and God said, look, you asked permission to go through their land, and, and they gave it to him. Now we come to the first of these nations then. We come to the very first nation of those nations that had rebelled against God, where these giants are now living, and, uh, and, and we come to verse number 26. Now watch the change in God's instructions. And I sent messengers out to the wilderness of Kedemoth unto Sihon, the king of Heshbon. Sihon, that, remember that name. With words of peace, saying... Let me pass through thy land. This is Moses talking, by the way. I will go along by the highway. I will, I will neither turn to the right hand nor to the left. You can sell me meat for money that I may eat, give me water for money that I may drink. Only I will pass through on my feet. Verse 29, as the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir, and the Moabites did. He said, look, this is what we did with these other two places where we've just been. We just passed through. We, we, didn't, we didn't cause them any trouble. And then we come to verse number 30, and here's the big one. But Sihon, king of Heshbon, would not let us pass by him. Why? For the Lord thy God hardened his spirit, hardened his spirit, and made his heart obstinate, that he might deliver him into thy hand, as appears this day. So God hardened his heart that he would not allow them to pass through. God sort of has a target on, on Sihon, doesn't he? We're going to talk about why here in just a minute, but before we do that, I want, to, I, want to, I want to draw your attention to that. God hardened his spirit. Does that remind you of another story we've already covered? What does it sound like? Remember back in Egypt? Pharaoh. It sounds like Pharaoh, doesn't it? Back in Egypt, the, the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, I, want to, I, want to, I just want to teach you something. I, 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 have, I was thinking about preaching this entire thing as a message, um, <clears throat> but let me give you all this truth tonight. When the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, we read that and it sounds to us like that's really not fair. It sounds to us like God is, is forcing them to, to do the wrong thing. Actually, when the, the word hardened his heart, if you, if you define those in the original Hebrew, that the way an, an original uh, Hebrew would have read that is that God strengthened their will. Strengthened the will. Hardened the heart is the same thing as strengthening the will. Pharaoh already had a will. God just strengthened the will that was already there. See, Pharaoh didn't want to let the people go. God just simply strengthened the will that he already had. And God didn't force him to, to do that. And the same thing here. God is not necessarily interfering. God is not necessarily forcing uh, Sihon to, to, be, uh, uh, to be uncooperative with the Israelites. But, uh, but God is, cer certainly, is certainly strengthening the spirit he already had to be that way. He was already obstinate. God is just simply making him more so. So here's the, so here's the, here's the question then that we ask. So why is God tar targeting Sihon? Why did God tell the Israelites, pass through Esau's area, pass through uh, Lot's area, but when you come to this, why is God targeting Sihon so that there's definitely going to be a battle here? He is going to be the first battle that the Israelites will face now that they are in this area. Why is that? Well, this is the land of the Amorites. And why hadn't they been displaced? In other words, why were the giants, why were they still there uh, in, in this area? For that answer, we have to go all the way back to a conversation God had with Abraham. I know this is really, this is getting complicated, but, but try to stay with this. So God is targeting Sihon, who is the Ammonite king. We go back to something that God said to, to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 13. And notice what God said to Abraham hundreds of years prior. And he said unto Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, talking about Egypt, and shall serve them, talking about slavery, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And we know this has already happened, right? This all came true. And also that nation whom they serve will I judge. And he did. Afterward, they come, they'll come out with great substance. All these things are true. All those things came true that God had promised to Abraham. He said, and you'll go to your fathers in peace. And you'll be buried in a good old age. But watch verse 16 now. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. They're going to come back to this area. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Do you see that? What does that mean? God was saying the Amorites are a sinful people, and sometimes God has a timetable. 
Sometimes God allows a sinful people a certain period of time for their sin or their iniquity to become full. And that's what he's talking about. So 400, 500 years prior, he's telling Abraham, there's going to come a day when your descendants are going to be freed from Egypt. And about that same time, the Amorites are going to be ready for the picking. The Amorites' sin will be full at that point, and it will be time for me to judge them. So isn't it an amazing thing that God puts all these things together? He told Abraham this is what's going to happen. Now we're seeing it come to pass as we're reading in the book of Numbers. So God told Abraham this, and, uh, and now the nation of Israel has come out of Egypt at just the right time that the Amorites' iniquity has now come full. Now, is there any other significance of the Amorites? And again, this is the, the, we're answering the question, why is God targeting Sihon? Well, there's another significance to the Amorites, and which we're told later. The book of Amos, chapter 2, tells us what it is. Verse number 9, yet I destroyed the... Now, we're, now, we're, now we've gone forward in time, and God is, God is talking backward now. Yet I destroyed the Amorite before them, whose... Now watch this. Whose height was like the height of the cedars. Does it sound like a giant to you? And he was strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Verse 10, also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. So this is God telling years later, this is what I did back in those days. These were giants. They were giants. In fact, we're going to look at a description here in just a minute uh, of a very, very vivid description. So so now they're entering into this land of the giants. And that's why he's treating them differently than he treated the descendants of, of Esau and the descendants of Lot. He said, these are giants. Now, these are not going to pass through. You're not just going to pass through. You're not going to trade with them. You're going to conquer them. And then we're going to find out, and they don't just conquer them, but they actually wipe them out entirely. So this isn't just a battle for land, but it's a battle between Yahweh and the gods of those, uh, of those uh, that, that, that produced this, this uh, race of giants in the first place. So how did the battle go? Well, the Israelites won the battle. They believed God. They won the battle. But Sihon called on a friend of his. Sihon called on another king in the area to come and help him. And that king's name was Og, O-G. So uh, let's pick up that reading in Deuteronomy chapter 3. And this is where it really gets pretty interesting. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 1. And we turned and went up the way to Bashan, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us, he and all his people to battle at Adrai. And the Lord said unto me, Fear not him, fear don't, don't fear him, for I will deliver him and all his people and his land into your hand, and thou shalt do unto him as thou didst unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, which dwelt at Heshbon. Now watch, continue, verse, uh, verse number, uh, verse, uh, I'm sorry. So, who, so who, is this, who is this Og? Verse number 11. Notice verse number 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. So he was a giant. Watch this description. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. His bed was made out of iron. It is, uh, is it not in Rabbah, the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof. And four cubits, the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. How, 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 does anybody know how big a cubit is? They believe it's about 18 inches. It's supposed to be from here to here. They believe it's about 18 inches. So that would make that about 13 and a half feet long. That's a big bed. That's a big bed. And, and uh, you know, so, so we have this, this he's got this, this huge bed, you know, six feet wide. So, so we're talking about... A, Og is actually one of the legendary giants. This is who the Israelites are facing. He's one of the legendary giants. Now, how does this end? Well, we pick up that in verse number three. So how does this battle end? So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan and all his people. And we smote him until there was none left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city that we took not from them, three score cities in the region of Argob, the king of Og, and Bashan. And uh, continue on, verse 5. And all these cities were fenced with high walls, etc. Verse 6. Now watch carefully. And we utterly destroyed them, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon, utterly destroying the men, women, and children of every city. Now, this is one of those places where people 
where, where people, when we don't, if we don't understand or we don't really believe, we don't trust that God is always right. We come to a verse like this. I mean, let's be honest. Women and children, you're all are quiet. I know we've done a ton of scripture, but it was all leading up to this point. Why is God telling them to destroy the women, to kill the women, and even the children? He didn't do that in the other places. In fact, many times God does. In fact, God didn't even want all the men killed in the other cities. Why is he killing all the men, the women, and the children of all these cities that Og was the king of? They're not human. They're not human. You see, these are not, these are not the, the children of men. These are, they're not human. They are the descendants of these Nephilim. They're these, these corrupted lines that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God took wives of, of the women and produced this race that had continued on. And remember, we talked last, that's what we talked about last week, right? People say, well, why didn't they all die out in the flood? Well, because God, they, they, they're not human. They didn't have to die in the flood. They're not even bound to earth. So we have this, this race. This is why in all these stories that we read in the Old Testament, this is where we're going to see much more of this. All, you know, people who don't, who don't understand, they look at this and they say, well, boy, this is a God I can't follow. I can't, I can't serve a God who, who commits genocide and who, who, who wants to kill uh, women and children. And by the way, some of the later stories, they're going to get even more graphic than this. But here we see it right here in, in, play, in, in the women and the children of every city. So why do they do that? Simply because they weren't human. These were, not the, these were not human inhabitants. They were instead these corrupted lines going all the way back to these sons of God that produced this, this race of something other than, other than human. Now, Joshua would bring all this later together, uh, later on, after, all the, after, after Joshua has entered the promised land, after they've defeated a bunch of enemies, we'll find later on, we'll just pick up these verses and we're done. Joshua chapter 12 and verse 4, I just want to show you one more thing and then we're done. Verse 4, and the coast of Og, king of Bashan, so he's referring back to this, which was of the remnant of the giants that dwelt at Ashtaroth at Edrei, and reigned in, notice the next phrase, Mount Hermon. Now, where did we hear about Mount Hermon? Or where, what is Mount Hermon also known for? Mount Hermon is the place where the sons of God that we, wrote, that we read about actually descended and began to take the wives of human people. So this is, the, this is the area, this is the setting then. And I think oftentimes we think that, that Jericho was the first battle in the promised land. It actually wasn't. We see right here, before they ever made it that far, they had to deal with these giants. And so the war is just now beginning. The nation of Israel now, they, this, this generation has come up, but it looks like these, this generation, they're going to believe God. Yes? They're going to believe God, and they're going to trust God, and so that's why they're going to be able to go in and move their way through the promised land and take all of the other cities, giants or no giants. They've come to realize that they have an unseen God who is stronger and more powerful than even what they can see with their very own eyes. Now, that's a lot of history tonight, so hang in there, but I wanted you to see that uh, the giants are not going to be a problem for God's people. All right. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And uh, we'll begin next week in earnest. Joshua will be the one to lead the God's people through the promised land. And they'll see more giants.